It's episode 57 of the Social Restaurant Podcast. This week we're talking about America's first fast food restaurant. Stay tuned. It's the restaurant industry's most popular show on how social media, mobile, and other disruptive technologies are changing the way your customers think, act, and interact with your restaurants online. Each week we talk with some of the best and brightest minds in the restaurant business, from owners and operators to chefs, marketers, and their technology partners. Welcome to the Social Restaurant Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is episode 57 of the Social Restaurant Podcast. I am your host, as always, Nate Riggs. Last week, we had the pleasure of talking with Susie Bataraco, who is the president of Culinary Tides, a very interesting little consulting firm that works with a variety of different brands to identify restaurant trends and kind of figure out what's coming next in the industry. This week, we are recording live in the NR Media Group studios, and we're going to be discussing how to remain relevant in today's changing environment, and we're highlighting this conversation with one of America's oldest and finest fast casual, or excuse me, fast food brands. Uh, you're going to re- want to really stick around for this interview, so stay tuned for that. But first, I do want to mention that NR Media Group is planning a new production for 2015 that is going to be live every Friday at 8 a.m., and that is the Columbus Marketing Show. We're going to be conducting interviews with some of Central Ohio's top marketers and really to dig into what is their most innovative ideas, what are they working on. Look for a lot of emails, social media tweets, Facebook updates, and things to come out about that show, but we would love for you to join us for the Columbus Marketing Show. NR Media Group is the presenting sponsor sponsor of Social Restaurant Podcast. We change the way businesses understand and use digital media to connect with customers, earn their trust, and win their business for life. You can learn more about us at nrmedia.biz. And while you're there, you can also download our sample chapters of a new book we're working on called The Video Engineering Playbook. Be sure to check that out and let us know what you think. Our guest today is a family member of the oldest fast food restaurant in the nation, and that is White Castle. White Castle was founded in Wichita, Kansas in 1921 by Edgar Waldo, a.k.a. Billy A. Ingram. Uh, The founders actually set out to change the public perception of cleanliness around beef in the industry. At the time, Americans were very hesitant to eat ground beef after up in Sinclair's 1906 novel, The Jungle. in this novel, he publicized kind of the poor sanitation practices around meatpacking, and that sent a riff through the industry at the time. White Castle came on the scene to say, you know what, we can do things differently. In fact, it's interesting that uh, the original decor and design of these restaurants was kept a porcelain white to give the feel of a very sterile, clean environment to kind of combat this trend. The company is more than just a company. It's an experience that has touched literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people across the country, uh, even to the point, and we'll hear some of these stories later, where uh, individuals, personal individuals in my family were even willing to drive two hours to go get a a sack of White Castles and bring them back home for dinner. We're going to get into all this in just a minute, but first, the news. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with this week's News of the Week with Melissa Christian. How are you, Melissa? I'm awesome, Nate. How are you? Very good. What do we uh, What do we have this week? What's interesting? Okay, well, I thought we'd talk a little bit about mobile apps for restaurants. Um, this is, maybe it's not new to everybody, but it's new to me. Um, something that was always terrifying for me as a consumer was having to actually call a restaurant and talk to them on the phone or actually go to the restaurant and talk to a person. Like the Chipotle line is terrifying for me. So I really enjoy these days when I can get on my phone and go to the little White Castle app and I can order right online, do my modifications and pay right on my mobile app. I barely have to talk to anybody when I actually go in there. Um, And how I think this is really gonna benefit restaurants is that they can use this in a whole new various of ways. So they can tie in their loyalty programs. They can have things like Apple Pay. So you just go with, you don't even have to have your credit card anymore. You can just walk in with your phone and pay right from there. So I think this is really going to be beneficial in speeding up the process of ordering. It's going to get people through the lines faster. You're not going to stand in line at Chipotle for a half hour like you do at lunchtime right now. So I think it has all kinds of benefits. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, the rollout of Google Wallet and Apple Pay is something that a lot of restaurants are starting to pay attention to. We've seen a lot of success with Starbucks really kind of being the pack leader in terms of custom mobile app. But what's interesting is, is you know, obviously this is something really important to restaurant brands. But at the same time, with that, the marketplace has become 
become very, very muddy. Uh, for instance, at this year's National Restaurant Association show, there was probably 20 to 30 different mobile app vendors, all with different plays on loyalty programs, mobile payment, uh, different types of marketing that you could do, even game mechanics in these apps, which I'm still on the fence as to whether or not that's effective. So as a restaurateur, if you're an operator or even a restaurant marketer, how do you choose? How, how, how do you get through the mud of this industry and pick what's going to be right for you? And I think that's the challenge right now. Everybody's looking at which one do we go with, which one benefits us the most. And I think it's going to be about what they can use through that. You know, can we do just paying? Can we tie in our loyalty programs? What can we do to make our app the biggest and the best? So that's going to be really important for them. One of the questions, too, especially with the larger brands, you know, they have the budget, they have the manpower to potentially develop a custom app, or do you go with one of the off-the-shelf systems, which may be more positioned towards uh, single-unit locations or smaller chains, mm -hmm. but all of those different applications and companies are trying to get into the doors of these big brands because that's where the money is. And yet, a lot of them are, you know, maybe they have one large brand client, but then if you look at the rest of the client list, it's a lot of smaller restaurants. From a technology perspective, it's a really risky game at this point because if you're going to roll the dice with one of these new, and, and a lot of them are very much startups, you want to make sure that this company that you're going to invest money in is going to be here five years from now. Uh, and there's really no way to know. I think we are going to see a lot of consolidation in the industry in terms of some of these app players getting, getting swallowed up by other companies like POS Systems uh, or even marketing suites specifically designed for restaurants. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. If, if you as a consumer were using a mobile app, you've talked a little bit about you know trying to get through the line faster, mobile payment. What else is important for you in terms of content to see on that mobile app? I really like things like nutritional information. You can go on and look at the calories that are in everything. You can check out the menu before you even get there. I know that when I go to a drive-thru and I pull up there and I'm trying to read the menu really fast before they ask me what I want, and it's, it's a little stressful and anxiety-inducing for me personally, which is silly, but I love that you can check out everything about that restaurant on there. You can find a location based on where you are, just on your GPS, and it says, here's your closest location, there you go. There's your order, I'm paid, I'm done. This is going to be something to keep the eye on because a lot of restaurants are now moving into this direction and coming up next we have a very special guest whose brand I think is not only very traditional and has a great history behind it but is also very progressive in terms of technology. Kiosks and mobile ordering and mobile payment is something that they are pushing towards and we're going to be back with that guest right after, right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I am here with a very special guest, and this is a really interesting episode for us for Social Restaurant Podcast, because this is the very first time that we are doing things a little bit differently. We're taking the in-studio brand casting approach, and with us today, we have a guest from one of my very favorite restaurants, uh, especially at 2 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> Lisa Ingram, who is the President and Chief Operating Officer of White Castle Systems. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thanks. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to have you in. Obviously, if you are born in and around Columbus, Ohio, White Castle is very, very near and dear to your heart. Uh, and you've got a ton of background in this family and this company. So if you don't mind, I want to jump right into it. Tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up as the great-granddaughter of the founder of this amazing QSR, this amazing quick service restaurant. It's one of the granddaughters of the founder. Um, it's, it's been a really great experience, but it was pretty typical, um, you know, growing up in Columbus. And certainly I have a lot of memories of coming to the office and sitting on um, Rosemary's lap. She was our switchboard operator. And um, I remember pulling out the little plugs on the switchboard and putting them in the right spots. Um, I remember the very steep blue stairs that went downstairs into um, our cafeteria. So I have a lot of memories of that. I remember certainly going to the restaurants, um, but I, you know, it was kind of a typical um, upbringing, um, which I think is part of the great thing about our family in terms of just really being very, very um, down to earth and not letting um, the fact that we started the food industry, I can say, started the, uh, the restaurant industry, really go to our heads. So it was, it was a fun sort of upbringing. But you know, the brand is a wonderful thing to be founded in 1921 uh, in Wichita, Kansas. 
and to be uh, here in Columbus since 1934. So we've been on Goodale since 1934 and um, have really loved Columbus. It's been a wonderful town for us. It's been a great headquarters for us. And we're very excited about the future growth opportunities that we have in Columbus and um, around the country. Now, White Castle is, is a brand with a lot of firsts. You guys are known as the first fast food hamburger chain, the first to sell a million hamburgers, the first to sell a billion hamburgers, uh, way before the other large QSR chain, and also the first to sell frozen fast food. Obviously, this is a very innovative brand, but how do you maintain innovation against tradition of the company? Yeah, this is a, that's a great question. We, we are 93 years old and we have customers that have been with us for 93 years and we have customers that have been with us for you know nine days and so it's really sort of looking at what things can we do to honor the past but also embrace the future so to give some examples just the product development that we've recently been doing so we have a great breakfast sandwich but not a lot of people know about it We've had the breakfast sandwich for 15 or 20 years, and we've just started promoting it in the last three or four. And that really goes to a customer base that maybe likes the sliders but doesn't love them um, and wanted something different. And um, our breakfast sandwich on our Belgian waffles was a huge hit this year. And we had lots of customers, both old and new, that were very interested in that product. The Sriracha Chicken, another great example. Um, that product, might not appeal to our traditional customers who just want their slider. Don't, don't mess with the slider, don't mess with the 2x2 two two original. But um, some of the newer customers want a lot of different spices. They want a lot of different flavors. They want something new. And so the Sriracha Chicken was a great product to come out with and was very popular with, with um, the younger generation. So another thing that we're doing is technology. So um, we, we want to use technology to attract new customers and be relevant to the younger customers. And so when we look at um, some of those trends, they really like, um, they like to use technology, they like to use their iPhones, they like to use kiosks. And so in one of our stores in Columbus, number 26 in Hilliard, we were, we put in kiosks and um, experimented with that. And we had a lot of the new customers that were really interested in that. And we had some of the older customers that just still really wanted that personal interaction from our team members, which, um, you know, they've been coming into our stores for 20 or 30 years, and so our team members know their name, they know what they order, they know all about their family. And so it's those types of things. What things can we do to honor our um, past and our tradition and our customers that have been with us for decades? And what new things can we introduce, whether that's new products, whether that's new technologies, to attract those new customers that might want something a little bit different or a little bit more relevant in today's day? One of the things that, that I think is interesting is, is no matter what customer segment that you're in and, or what technology that you use, there is one thing that all the customers of White Castle have in common in this, there, that is this passion or this love of the slider, which is a term that you guys coined. Talk to me a little bit about where did the idea for the slider come from and, and, and what makes a slider different from a, a, a different, another hamburger that you would get from another restaurant? Well, it came from our customers. They actually um, came up with the, the term that it was so good that it would just slide down my throat because it's, um, you know, we steam grill our products on a bed of onions, so it's it's prepared differently than any other hamburger. So it's not going to taste like a hamburger that you make on your grill at home. It's not going to taste like a hamburger that you would get at another um, competitor. It's original, and that's what makes it so craveable and so unique is the cooking method and the way that we've done it for the past 90 years. And the term slider really came from our customers and we've embraced it and now we're very flattered by it because everybody's trying to imitate um, and put sliders on their own menu. I mean, you go into the finest restaurants in New York or in Columbus and everybody's got a slider, but it's not a White Castle. It's not the original slider and it never can be as good as the original slider just because of the way that we uh, make our product. So uh, I have an interesting story. My my grandfather, when I was growing up, we, we were you know 
I was raised in Northeast Ohio, but my grandfather and my grandmother actually were raised in Columbus, and their very first date was at a White Castle. And they always had this love for, for White Castle as a brand and as the food. And you know, as they, they kind of built their life, they moved around, end up in Northeast Ohio and had a family there. But every single Sunday, uh, my grandfather, and I believe the neighbor's name was actually Robert, they would get in the car after church and they would drive down to Columbus. They would go to the nearest White Castle. They would bring back you know, bags of, of sliders and that would be our family dinner on Sunday nights. Um, at the time, there was no White Castle in Northeast Ohio. Why have you chosen to kind of keep the footprint limited in terms of where these restaurants are? And, and with that, is there expansion plans to kind of blow out the brand and, and open new markets, or are you going to stay kind of more regionally located? Okay, well, there's a lot of great, great things to talk about in that question. So let me start with the story of your grandparents, because I love that story. Um, you know, part of the reason that uh, we started the Frozen products, which is this product that you could buy at the grocery store, it's exactly for the reason um, that your grandfather would make the track down to White Castle. We had lots of customers that would drive a couple of hours to get their, their uh, fix of White Castles, and when they came into the store, they would ask us probably to wrap each individual burger in wax paper and then put it in a box so that they could, so it would last the journey home and then potentially be put into the freezer. And we had a lot of customers that were doing this. And my father, who was president at the time, when he went out to visit each of the castles, he noticed that we had a lot of team members that were, that were doing this. And he asked one of the customers, and the customer would say, well, you know, I'm taking these home, and I'm going to eat these six, but then I'm going to put the other 14 in the freezer. And as we thought about that, and as he thought about that, we're thinking, well, you know, from a, an efficiency standpoint and from a food safety standpoint, we can do this better. And there must be a way to get the product so that customers could buy it in the grocery store. And that's really where the idea of um, the grocery store product came from. So while we have a limited footprint on restaurants, we are in all 50 states across the country with the frozen product. Um, and that really started you know, 25 years ago. That's a great, 25 years ago, that's a great business for us. We actually went out and tried to find a supplier. There were some suppliers that told my dad it was crazy. Fortunately, he didn't listen to them, and we ended up um, making it ourselves, and we currently have three manufacturing facilities that just make the frozen product. One of them we just opened last year in, um, in Vandalia, Ohio. We're very proud of that new facility. It actually received a Gold Lead certification, which we're very, very proud of. Excellent. Um, and that business continues to grow very well. Um, we believe that it, it does well in the markets that we have restaurants, and then obviously it does well in the, rest in the markets that we don't have restaurants as well because you know, whether you want to make the trek to the castle or whether you just want to walk downstairs to your freezer, uh, we want you to be able to get a White Castle product in either situation. What's the business impact of that new unit then in terms of, of frozen food versus the restaurants? Because it, we've seen other Ohio brands like Bob Evans kind of take the same approach where there's the product for the, the Bob Evans food products and Bob Evans restaurants and there's a split between their business. What does that look like for White Castle? So right now the frozen division is um, close to about 20% of our overall sales. So the vast majority of the company's revenue is still generated from the restaurants. And, but the, the frozen division is doing really well and we're, we're very proud to have it. And you know, building a third plant shows that it's continuing to grow and we're excited to continue to invest in that. We think there's a lot of opportunity with the frozen brand. You know, you can, right now you can get the cheeseburgers and the hamburgers, but we've got other great products in our restaurants that we'd like to expand into um, that distribution as well, as well as maybe some new products that we don't have in the restaurants. So we think there's a lot of great opportunity. It's, it's really interesting because when you talk about White Castle, this is really a brand that's been developed to have a cult-like following from people who are willing to drive two hours just to get the sliders. What is it about the White Castle brand that gets people so passionate, that gets people so tied to this brand that they're willing to do these crazy things? Sure, well, that's a couple of things. One, it helps when you've been around for a long time. So um, your first experience to White Castle is usually with somebody that's already had it. Um, and so it's... It's about an, indoctr an indoctrination or an introduction to the brand. Usually that person is either a family member or a friend. And so it, it, um, the love of the brand grows not only around the food, but also the experience that you have with that person. And that sort of blossoms as you go through childhood and you have several of those and then you go to college. And you know our brand, uh, we get asked to be a 
weddings, we get asked to be at tailgates, we get asked to be at parties, um, we get asked to be at funerals. I mean, so it's it's really a big part of people's life. Whenever there's a party, people think of White Castle, and we're really honored that they think about our brand in that way, and we want to continue to foster that because we, you know we like to have fun, and our brand is fun, and we've been around for 93 years, which is which is unique, um, and we've got a lot of products and. Um, a lot of things that fit well into that. The other big key component of that is our team members. So when you come into the restaurant, if you come in often, it's very possible that the team members behind the counter will know your name, they will know what you order, um, they'd love to talk to you about your family, and so there's a relationship that develops between our customers and our team members, because our team members have been with us for, uh, we have great longevity, so one out of um, four of our team members have been with us for over 10 years, we have people on in our restaurant leadership team that this is the only place they've ever worked when they started. They started when they were 16, and they now have 25, 30, even 40 years of service. Um, and that's true of our executive team as well. So we have a lot of really great longevity, and, and that's part of the other sort of secret sauce. It's the product, it's the fact that um, people want to engage with the product in a fun way with their family and friends, and it's the team members that deliver that service that make the difference, which is part of the reason why we've chosen not to franchise um, our restaurants, is because we want to make sure that we're controlling that experience that happens in the restaurants. I think one of my, my favorite examples of the service that you can get at White Castle only comes one time a year. Uh, two years ago, my wife and I were, were because I don't plan things, looking for a place to eat Valentine's Day dinner. And so we happened to drive past a White Castle and noticed that there was all kinds of hubbub going around in this restaurant. And we walked in and, they, and, and were greeted at the door that said, well, do you guys have a reservation? And I said, well, what do I need a reservation for? This is White Castle. Well, then we come to find out that every Valentine's Day, there's this special event where you can make a reservation and get white tablecloth service at a White Castle. And so the very next year, that was last year, we did that as our Valentine's date and had a really amazing time doing it. It was such a unique experience. Where did that idea come from? And, and tell me a little bit about how that plays out each year. Sure, we love Valentine's Day at White Castle. So where it came from, again, similar to where the name Slider came from, is our customers. So as you said, your grandfather and your grandmother had their first date at White Castle. That's very, very common when you've been around for 93 years. There are a lot of people that either met their spouse or had their first date. Um, at White Castle, and so it really came from our customers. They wanted to come and sort of re, um, reimagine or rekindle their love, and if their first date was at White Castle, then that's where they wanted to do it. And so it started in Minneapolis um, at a castle where they had a couple people that were doing that, so they put white tablecloths, and they really treat them well. They, um, you know, they put the white tablecloths down, they'd serve them, they'd take their orders, and it sort of blossomed from that because it's a great idea and it's not just true in Minneapolis. And so now it's across most of our castles that have um, dining rooms do this and Valentine's Day you have to make a reservation to come and eat at White Castle and it's a lot of fun. Our team members really love it because it's a, they get to interact um, with, it's a very happy occasion, they get to interact very well with customers. Um, it's a different experience. You know, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. I actually had the opportunity to work last Valentine's Day. It was snowing a lot. Um, yeah. And um, I was at two castles, and one, I got to meet a, a 94-year-old woman that had come to White Castle many years um, for Valentine's Day with her daughter, but her daughter couldn't get to Columbus because of the weather, and so she brought her three girlfriends. And so that was a lot of fun. And then I got to go down to the one um, at Second and High, number 13, and spend some time there. Um, helping to be the hostess and cleaning off tables and getting people sat and uh, it's just a fun experience everybody has a good time and we get very busy and so it's for us we like to give good fast service and that is a night that it's you know, it, everybody slows down a little bit and wants to take a little longer, and so it's it's a great experience. And now everybody from the corporate office is also participating in this service and, and mm -hmm. joining the restaurants, which is really interesting. I've even heard rumors that people have been married at a White yes, Castle. Yes, yes, yes. So we have, um, usually in every single city, we have a wedding around Valentine's Day, um, and that's a really fun occasion. So uh, we have some great pictures that we could share with you of amazing things that have transformed our castles, our uh, 
crews get in very much into decorating the castle to make it look really just wonderful. In Chicago, uh, we actually have a picture a couple years ago where our servicemen um, made a gazebo out of boxes, out of White Castle boxes. Oh, wow. It's really, really cool. And we had a, a really sweet couple get married um, in that castle. So we definitely go all out and we um, we're very, feel very fortunate to have uh, couples choose us to get married in around that time. Um. In talking about some of these pictures, so you guys, uh, these these we call them memorable moments. Memorable moments, yes. Uh, we we actually had a memorable moment taken when we were at Valentine's Day, which was uploaded to this Craver Nation yes. website. Talk to us a little bit about Craver Nation and what's really the fuel behind that being a part of the White Castle brand. Yeah, so um, I'm glad you took advantage of that. Um, we have a lot of customers that take pictures of themselves with our food or take videos of themselves having a great time with our food and we wanted to be able to capture that and we wanted our customers to have a way to share that with other people who love the brand just as much as they do and so we invented Craver Nation that came from um, customers talking about how much they crave the product and we sort of coined them Cravers. And so Craver Nation is a way for if you go and sign up, you can receive um, you can receive coupons, you can receive interactions from us. You can then also talk to other Cravers that have that love of White Castle and share your photos or share videos, et cetera. And it's a great way to create a community of people that love the brand and want to talk about the brand and that we can interact with um, more personally, which is what we're trying to do in today's um, day and age because we want to, you know, we want to know what makes our cravers tick and what excites them, what things they want to do with White Castle. Um, do they have any products that they think that we should try? Um, do they think that we should go to a particular location? If you go and look on our social media sites, either Facebook or Twitter, you'll see a lot of, please come to my town, please put a White Castle in, you know, wherever USA. And we look at that data and we um, look at other things that they might suggest in terms of, have you ever thought of putting, you know, X, Y, and Z on a, on a slider? My favorite slider is a double cheeseburger with no middle bun and extra pickles. And we ended up sort of testing that product. Yeah. Um, and so it's a great way for us to have more face, not face to face, but more one-on-one -on -one communication with our customers. So the feedback loop, is that is that the metric of success? And, and if so, how does it perform? What, what is, how is this impacting the business? Well, we certainly, we have a couple of different ways of feedback loop. loop. Um, Craver Nation is one of them. Uh, Facebook is another, Twitter is another, Instagram is another. Uh, we also have an IVR program. So when you come into a White Castle, you might, on your receipt, be given an opportunity to go give a survey about your experience. And we believe very highly in those. And we get from 30 to 50 surveys per month per location. And we aggregate that data to make sure that we are delivering on the service that um, our customers expect in terms of team member friendliness, in terms of product quality, in terms of cleanliness, in terms of likely to recommend, um, et cetera. So we have lots of different ways to collect feedback. And we really want to be able to utilize that and um, make sure that we're delivering a service and an experience that's going to make the customers come back. So yes, it's a feedback loop, but it's it's also a way for us to talk to the customers and engage with them and, you know, be f have fun with them and be funny with them. And um, and that's that's part of it as well. So it sounds like this, that Craver Nation is really uh, kind of a cornerstone in helping the brand and the business to also evolve yes. into kind of the next phase. One of the things uh, that I that I personally think was an interesting evolution of the brand happened in 2004, and we, we can't leave the show without talking about the movie <laughs> Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Sure. Uh, tell me a little bit about the initial reaction when you're approached by this this company who has the script and they want to make a movie like this, and then the next thing you know, this is a blockbuster hit, right. probably one of the top grossing movies of 2004. Uh, but again, very much away from what you would think of as the traditional, my grandfather's White Castle. Right. What were the internal discussions like sure. when that movie came out? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's not unusual for people to want to tell stories about White Castle. That's part of the brand. Um, you know, when you go and ask anybody about White Castle, they're like, oh, oh, oh I got to tell you a time when yada, yada, yada. And they, ha they always have a story about White Castle. So having stories about White Castle is not unique. Um, you know, we've had songs written about us. We've had books written about us. People have tried to copy us. So when we got the screenplay from these two guys from New Jersey who were hu huge White Castle fans, it wasn't that unusual. What was unusual was that New Line actually wanted to make it into a major motion picture. 
And you know, we are a small regional player. We're only in the Midwest and the East Coast. We have 400 locations, which is tiny compared to our competitors. And they wanted to make a national movie and put our name in the big lights. And so when we looked at the script, uh, the questions that my dad asked were, do they ever portray our products or our team members in a light that is not positive? And when you think about the movie, they don't. Yeah, doesn't. They're always portraying our products and our people in a very, very positive light. So while we don't endorse everything that Harold and Kumar go through in the movie, we think that the movie um, was a great benefit to the White Castle and the brand because it gave us national recognition and national notoriety that we would not have been able to afford otherwise. It's interesting because even throughout the movie, White Castle is positioned as the beacon. It, it is, is the destination is. that they're so they're struggling to get to. It's, right. it's that classic kind of journey storyline yes. that plays out. And that's very common. We get lots of stories very similar to that of, you know, I just had to have it and I I, all these adventures that I went through and this, these mishaps that sort of happened, to, but when I got to White Castle, ah, uh, you know, I was just so happy and so fulfilled. Nobody will ever look at Doogie Hauser in the same light That's again. That's right, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, inside joke for anybody who hasn't seen the movie, yes, go out and read yes, it today. Yes. White Castle is very traditional and yet also very progressive. Mm -hmm. What is next? in the progression of, of the White Castle brand. Where are you going? So we have a lot of great things that we are excited about. Um, our new products is definitely one of them. So this year we launched our um, waffle breakfast sandwiches, which were a big hit, and our chicken and waffles. Uh, we had our sriracha chicken sandwich, we had our shrimp nibblers, and we're now in our um, pizza slider uh, event. And so you will continue to see us looking at the two by two inch and what can we put in that slider. So. It may be a different protein, it may be different vegetables, it may be different sauces, um, it may be a lot of different things, but it will always be in that two by two inch platform. And so we're excited about that. We're also excited about you know just expanding our reach. So whether that is through the frozen division, which as I said, we just built a third plant and we are continuing to expand that product not only within the US to more groceries, but also outside of the US into Canada and um, into the military, so we're looking at that. And then we're always looking at, you know, how do we expand the restaurant footprint? So in our current cities, we've been spending a lot of time and um, money to revamp our current locations. So we have some locations that have been around since 1980, and so they're getting a little tired looking, and we want to update those to give a really nice, fresh look to our customers and a fresh environment for them to come into. But we're also going to look at, you know, where are other pockets that we could go to, um, to with our restaurant brand. So I think that you will continue to see that. The other thing that we're trying to do is um, figure out how to get our product to more people where they want it and when they want it. So the millennials really, um, they want to have it their way and they want to have it when they want it and they want to have it how they want it. And so our new product focus is helping with that. But also we have two food trucks and um, we're, we're looking at, you know, do we expand more of those? How do we get those out into the community more? One of the things that we did on Twitter this year, one of our promotions was you could um, send in your favorite, your video of why the food truck should come to your town. And so we had a gentleman that won this contest um, in San Antonio, and so the food truck did a did a tour and stopped at several locations before it got to San Antonio to um, be at a party for this guy that sent in the winning uh, video. And so there are lots of different things that we're looking at to try to expand our reach, both from the frozen side and from the restaurant side. Just so you know, we have Food Truck Friday in this building. Ah, so if nice. you're going to park a White nice. Castle food truck, I'm sure it'd be very popular. <laughs> okay. Um, as you grow the brand, and there's, there's obviously a lot of plans in place, Will White Castle always remain a family-owned business? Yes, in the near future, yes. I mean, we're, you know, a lot of people will ask us, have you ever thought about selling or have you ever thought about going public? And, you know, we're just really happy with being a family business. We think there's a lot of great things about being a family business. We're unique in that we're in the fourth generation, which is hard to get to. The If you look at the stats Absolutely. on family businesses, that's hard to get to. And so right now our goal is to get to the fifth generation and see if any of them have an interest in being in the business or and are qualified to be in the business. And so that's that's the plan for us right now. 
Well, from the bottom of my heart and, and from somebody who has literally grown up eating these sliders, uh, I want to thank you for being on the show today and I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because uh, I think for a lot of the audience who's listening as well as everybody in this room, White Castle is a big part of our, our lives and our dining habits. So thank you very much for what you and your family have done. Thank you so much for having, us, for having me. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for today. My very special thanks goes out to Lisa Ingram, president and COO of White Castle. Such a great brand. I do absolutely recommend that you check out what they're doing and check out the Crave Nation online. It's, it's a very interesting take into how restaurants can think digitally and really keep that fan base active. Tune in next week. We're going to be talking with Diane Warren, who is the owner of Katzinger's Deli here in Columbus. They are one of the oldest delis in Columbus and a true New York style Delhi, I'm sure you're not going to want to miss this episode because we are going to be talking about something that is very important in the restaurant industry, and that is servant leadership. The Social Restaurant Podcast is presented by NR Media Group, engineering business results through digital media. You can like this show, Social Restaurant Podcast, on Facebook by going to facebook.com forward slash social restaurant podcast, all one word. And again, while you are there, you can download sample chapters from the Video Engineering Playbook. Uh, this is a new book that's going to teach you how to build online libraries of content that will delight your audience. As always, I am Nate Riggs. I am your host, and I will see you back here next week for another Social Restaurant Podcast. Right, right, right.